Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the BRC Global Standard for Food Safety, Issue 8. Uh, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the changes to the new uh, version of the standard today. My name is Holly Cardozo. I'm a marketing member of the um, SA Global Assurance Team, and I'm pleased to welcome you today. So before we begin, I'll just speak to a few moderating slides so you understand how to interact with us. Um, firstly, you'll join the webinar and you're automatically set to mute. This is intentional. Should you wish to submit us a question, I encourage you to do so. Use the question and answer box. It's located in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Um, you can type in your answer, click send. I encourage you to do so as you think of them so we have some time to review. We'll speak to as many of these questions at the end of the webinar as we have time for. And uh, you can collapse that off to the right-hand side of your screen by clicking on those three small arrows once again. So we'll, I'll remind you that uh, we'll record the webinar today for any team members that are unable to um, attend. You can share the recording along with the slide deck within two business days. With that, um, let's kick over to our presenter. So Yuxo, welcome to our um, to our webinar today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'll just give a quick intro. He is a one of our technical managers uh, for BRC with SIA Global. And Yukasel has um, 20 years experience in food industry prior to becoming an auditor in 2002. He audits um, a number of our GFSI recognized schemes, including BRC, of course, um, and has a couple of accolades. He won Auditor of the Year for um, uh, BRC in 2017. So with that, um, your wealth of information, I'm very pleased to welcome you here today, Yukasel, and I'll kick it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Holly. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Um, everyone. Uh, today's agenda is uh, similar to the one that we did some time ago, but uh, we'll, go, we'll go into a little bit of deeper into certain aspects, especially the uh, newcomers in, in the in the standard. Uh, we'll talk about the back, uh, background and timeline of the issue eight and changes to the requirements and changes to the audit protocol, and then next steps what we want to do. Well, in, uh, of course, the uh, uh, BRC uh, Global Standard for Food Safety, the main uh, aim is to improve food safety in general and also facilitate the improvements and efficiencies in the manufacture of products. Uh, this is a food safety management system, needless to say, that it, it does help streamline the, the one's procedures and processes in a, uh, of manufacture of food products. Also, in the meantime, uh, it does enable manufacturers to meet the demands of their customers and reducing, hopefully, a uh, multiple order. The scope of the BRC's <coughs> global standard for food safety is really the processed foods, both own brand and customer branded, raw materials or ingredients for use by food service and food manufacturers, primary products such as fruit and vegetables, and pet foods for domestic animals. So these are all, if you notice, that product-based uh, scope. There are no services here. And the pet food is being added recently. The key changes of the issue eight is uh, our development of a product safety culture. This is the single most uh, probably important part of it. Expansion of requirements of, for environmental monitoring, encouraging sites to further develop systems for security and food defense, and adding clarity to the requirements for high risk, high care, and ambient high care production risk zones, and provided, providing greater clarity for sites manufacturing pet food. And of course, all of this has been basically put in place to ensuring that the uh, global applicability and GFSI benchmarking. Uh, I must point out that in this issue eight, BRC Global Standard for Food Safety uh, has been streamlined uh, to the effect that uh, it is now very comprehensive yet, uh, very easy to follow, and a, a better standard than the previous versions. Some time scales here. Um, uh, hopefully, all of you received the uh, August 2018 published uh, standard. 
uh, the standard published, of course, with the interpretation and key changes documents. Uh, in September, as we speak, the ATPs are being trained. And uh, in October, the auditors and then site, uh, uh, site trainings will begin. And February 1st, 2018, uh, we'll start the audits in uh, issue eight. With regards to the changes, now the first, first and big one is that the food safety culture, the background uh, for this uh, and an objective of, of it is really the uh, food safety culture, uh, it's not tangible, but it's a fundamental factor in the management of product safety. It's challenging to audit. Uh, however, it's important that food safety culture is considered within the requirements of the standard. Uh, therefore, the requirement has been uh, put in place that the site shall plan to maintain and develop product safety and quality culture within the business. Here are some of the changes. Uh, this particular clause 112 has been added as a new clause. It, it pushed the other clauses in, in its place further down, of course. Uh, uh, but it specifically uh, words that the site's senior management shall define and maintain a clear plan for the development and continuing improvement of food safety and quality culture. This, this shall include defined activities involving all sections of the site that have an impact on product safety, uh, action plan indicating how the activities will be undertaken, measured and intended timescales, review of the effectiveness of the completed activities. Defined activities mean, of course, that uh, uh, one can take the, the flow diagram of the HUSP plan and then uh, uh, define the activities in there and then say, okay, these are the ones that we're going to follow through in order to measure uh, the food safety culture and then review the results uh, on some sort of a uh, frequency. And the changes on 114 uh, is the, it's an amendment. Uh, this is actually uh, inserting the management into the management review, uh, the objectives that relates to the food safety culture because one of the one of the objectives would relate to the food safety culture. And then here it says that any objectives that haven't been met to understand the underlying reasons, this information shall be used when setting future objectives and to facilitate continuous improvement. So basically there will be a continuous feedback from the, uh, the measure of objectives, tracking of these objectives back into the system so that the system can be improved on an ongoing basis. The next one is the, the 115. This has been amended as well. Uh, uh, product safety is the responsibility for all the, all the staff, not just one, a few selected uh, individuals in a plant. Therefore, all staff need to know how to report concerns and incidents. Uh, we always looked in the past that uh, there should be a healthy level of uh, frequency of, of, of meetings within a plant. Uh, but of course, this time, uh, issue eight, actually says that at least monthly there should be a meeting where uh, all the happenings within the plant would be exchanged uh, between the floor all the way to the senior management. Uh, this clause has been added. Uh, this is a, a new clause essentially targeting uh, the employees to confidentially report any food safety issues uh, within the company to the company's senior management, of course. Uh, the mechanism could be a phone number or some, some other ways of uh, reaching uh, or communicating the issues uh, to, the, to the management. Company's senior management shall have a process for assessing these concerns and the records of the assessment where appropriate actions taken shall be documented. So these will be uh, auditable, in other words. Uh, one, one eight is being amended. It is basically uh, 
targeting some of the regulatory uh, changes in different countries, for instance, in the U.S., the CISMA, uh, companies' senior management shall have a system in place to ensure that the site is kept informed of any reviews uh, and reviews uh, all relevant registration in the country where the product is being sold, uh, where known, of course. 1113 is at it. Uh, this particular one is uh, uh, relating to the BRC Global Standards logo. Uh, there was nothing really in the past uh, with regards to the logo use. Uh, there are some guidelines in the part three in the, in the audit protocol. Uh, you can read it in here. But uh, uh, there are now some actions that uh, they will be taken that the logo use will be, uh, will be monitored through the audits. Uh, as you know, that the, other than the marketing uh, or websites and etc., the BRC logos are not to be put on any products uh, because it's not uh, for that reason. And uh, uh, this particular clause was added because of that. Uh, before we move to the uh, HACCP uh, food safety plan, uh, with regards to the food safety culture, uh, all the, the plans put in place uh, in the first year are not going to be audited for their effects or the results because uh, that will be something that try and error. What, what will be audited, however, is that the, those requirements, if the three requirements being mentioned, have been put in place and then there's a mechanism that is sort of rolling itself. So that will be the uh, subject to audit, not necessarily what the outcome results and, and the entire workings of the mechanism. Now, uh, the HACCP, the section two, um, as you know, uh, if, if you look at the HACCP slash food safety plan, now the, wherever you see HACCP within the, the issue eight, uh, will, there will be a slash or and or or food safety plan. Uh, this is because some countries, for instance, in the US, uh, regulatory requirements that incorporate HACCP processes outlined by Codex Alimentarius, but use different terminology, like preventive controls. And this is basically uh, a HACCP. It's, it's a risk and hazard analysis uh, system method, uh, but the terminology is different. The specific terminology within the standard, such as HACCP, prerequisites, critical control points, are intended to utilize the most commonly used global terminology to describe expectations. Uh, but this doesn't mean all the sites have to be using this particular specific terminology of the standard. But are expected to fully meet the requirements. As you know, that there are those uh, sub-clauses the, under the section two, which very uh, effectively documents uh, and instructs uh, or any other food safety system should be built. Uh, therefore, the, the wording for Section 2 of the standard on the HACCP Food Safety Plan uh, reviewed uh, to ensure compatible in all countries and geographies. Now, the key changes, uh, I just put a few of the uh, changes in here, uh, as you see, 2.1.1 uh, with regards to the team leader. Um, team leader training. Uh, has to include if there is a legal requirement for specific training. This says, you know, that if, if uh, for instance, an example, FDA requires that PCQI training is, uh, is a mandatory, then we will look for that, the has some leader to have that training. Right now, it doesn't say anything like that, but in some cases, it might in some other countries. Uh, 271 is really the, the hazard analysis. Uh, hazard analysis have been uh, enriched, uh, if you see here, that the microbiological physical contamination, chemical and ra radiological contamination, and fraud, of course, uh, because that could affect the, the safety of the food product, as well as the food defense, where malicious contamination of products could occur. Uh, uh, 214.1 has also been added uh, some sections. Uh, this is the, the, the emergence of new risk, known adulteration or other relevant published information. 
such as the recall of a similar product. For instance, the HACCP, this, this close, by the way, is relating to the review of the HACCP plan. It, it has to be reviewed if there is a, if there is a recall of a, of a similar product that could affect could happen to our product as well, that we need to go back and review our pr processes so that, that to avoid uh, that recall occurring in our plant as well. Where appropriate, the changes shall also be reflected in the company's product safety policy and food safety objectives. If we change our HACCP plan, obviously the uh, policy uh, and our objectives might be affected. Uh, Essentially, uh, whatever you look at in this uh, issue eight, everything is better connected with each other. Therefore, not one clause is on its own uh, a clause. It is related to something else somewhere else within the standard. Therefore, it is really a, a better, uh, a wholesome standard in that respect now. couple of other changes. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I put these in uh, because uh, in order to uh, point out that uh, basically every single clause almost has some addition or some changes, modifications in the standard, in issue eight. Uh, here you'll see, for instance, uh, brand new additions to document control and records control. For instance, uh, where documents are stored in electronic form, they shall also be stored securely. Uh, similarly, uh, the records will be stored secu uh, securely, electronic records. Uh, not, uh, I, I, I have to point out that these are, of course, also to uh, support and be aligned with the uh, other global uh, trends as well as the FISMA uh, requirements. FISMA also has electronic records requirements. So these are sort of lining up with, with every other um, uh, regulations out there. And also it does make sense. Uh, other big, um, well not necessarily a very big change, but there's a change here in order to assist essentially to uh, to us uh, in, in or when we are implementing our internal audit uh, program. Uh, many sites, uh, that was the, the finding of, of BRC, that uh, many sites are still not effectively scheduling their internal audits throughout the year. Their audits are only completed once or twice a year. The system is more likely to lead to a fall in standards between audits. Uh, therefore, the 3.4.1 amended to make sure that the safety management systems are being assessed in depth at regular intervals, at least four audit dates per year. Basically, what this means is this. <clears throat> there shall be a scheduled program of internal audits. At a minimum, program shall include at least four different audit dates spread throughout the year, which means basically, if the, if the standard has now, nine different clauses. All these clauses have to be audited at least once a year. But this frequency of each activity or each clause or sub-clause depends on the risk and depending on the how we uh, uh, the findings were in the previous year's internal audits. If there were failings in one area, Obviously, we need to audit it in twice a year, or maybe three times, maybe four times. At a minimum, the scope of the internal audit program shall include HACCP, or food safety plan, including the activities to implement, supplier approval, corrective actions, and verification, prerequisite programs, hygiene, pest control, and sanitation, uh, food defense and food fraud prevention plans, procedures implemented to achieve the standard. Each internal audit within the program shall have a defined scope and consider a specific activity or section of the HACCP or food safety plan. Uh, one last on the internal audit before we go into the supplier approval. Um, uh, 
four, at least four times a year doesn't mean the entire standard has to be audited four times. Standard has to be divided at least to four a year, or you can divide it 12, and then every month you do a certain part. Uh, but it has to be at least four times a year. Some areas might be audited twice in those four or four times, but the entire audit, the, the standard has to be audited at least once a year in four different slices. Um, and next, uh, some changes on, on the supplier approval. Uh, this was uh, partially uh, to show the GFSI benchmarking for some of the changes. Uh, safety, integrity, legality, and the quality of raw materials and fundamentals to site uh, operations. Uh, these are, of course, uh, all uh, pro provision from the suppliers. Requirements that all of the requirements reviewed and updated to ensure rigorous controls uh, of raw materials whilst maintaining practical application. Here's uh, one or two examples. 3.11, this is the first in the supplier approval has been amended. Uh, the risk assessment for a raw material shall be updated. When there's a change in raw material, the processing of a raw material, or the supplier of a raw material, the risk assessment needs to be repeated. If a new risk emerges, we talked about the uh, recall earlier, for instance, if there has been a recall on certain uh, raw material, uh, we need to review our risk assessment. Following a product recall or withdrawal where a specific raw material has been implicated at least every three years, uh, risk assessment for raw materials and the suppliers attached to it. Uh, 3.512 is amended. Uh, the approval procedure shall be based on risk, which was always there, and include either one or a combination of a valid certification to the applicable BRC uh, global standard or GFSI benchmark standard. The scope of the certification shall include the raw materials purchased. Basically, if you if we have a, a certificate from our supplier indicating that uh, the supplier's certificate scope was, uh, of the certificate was uh, flour but didn't include, the, let's say, the wheat flour, it's included on, the, on the, some other flowers, but the supplier is buying wheat flour, then that's not actually a valid certificate for that particular raw material. Supplier audits with a scope to include product safety, traceability, HACCP review, and good manufacturing practices undertaken by an experienced and demonstrably competent product safety auditor where the supplier audit is completed by a second or third party, the company shall be able to basically demonstrate the competency of the auditor and confirm that the scope of the audit includes product safety, traceability, and et cetera. Uh, so lots, lots actually changed in the supplier approval. The, um, Here's a quick uh, uh, information with regards to the management of outsourced processing. This is this is also one of the areas that uh, uh, not well understood because it's it's a little bit complex. And here is a sort of a formulation uh, to basically define outsourced processing. Uh, outsourced processing is is a subcontracted processing uh, where an intermediate production process or step in the manufacture of a product is completed at another company or site and is being sent back. So this is the outsource processing. We, uh, we have a product, let's say that we uh, make the dough, send it outside to be baked, and then they send it back, we pack it, we cool it, and we pack it, and then we send it outside. Might not be the perfect example, but that's really the outsource processing. Uh, we are only outsourcing a step in the manufacture of a product. What is not outsourced processing is, is in here. If the complete production is done off-site at a, a contract manufacturer, that's not outsourced processing. 
uh, off-site packing. We, we make the product, send it somewhere else to be packed, and they pack it, and uh, that's the finished product. That's not outsourced processing. And then these products are not returned to the, to the site, whatever we send outside. That's not outsourced processing. Being to corrective and preventive actions. Uh, this is to uh, basically re uh, remind you, we always ask uh, about the uh, root cause analysis, uh, uh, but this sort of basically issues eight now reinforces that the site shall have a procedure for the completion of root cause analysis. Whenever there is a corrective action, 3.7 is corrective and preventive actions. Whenever there's a corrective action, preventive actions, there has to be a root cause analysis. There has to be a certain method to do that. Uh, then related to that, further, it says the analysis of non-conformities for trends shows there has been a significant increase in a type of non-conformity. Uh, or non-conformity places the safety, legality, or quality of a product at least at risk. So uh, these are uh, call, these, these incidents call for root cause analysis. And a major change again, uh, so you call that 4.2, well currently, it's, uh, it's really relying on the physical security of, of a site. Uh, now it has been sort of um, uh, uh, reshuffled uh, in order to meet the GFSI requirements. It's now food defense, site security and food defense. Um, uh, as you see, the background and objectives really, the vigorous food defense have gained renewed understanding and should form an integral part of factory protocols. Procedures adapted to ensure the food safety of raw, uh, safety of raw materials and products from malicious contamination or theft. These are against the deliberate contaminations. Uh, amended section is threat risk assessment with actions, a plan based on. This is basically um, uh, he, with regards to the uh, uh, vulnerability assessment, if you recall, in issue seven for the uh, against the fraud uh, of materials. This is a similar system, which is also based pretty much like HACCP, uh, but in which case we are assessing the threats to the uh, to the products or raw materials and uh, and to the process basically or the site itself uh, risks are assessed threats are assessed and uh, with the action plans or measures and controls and put in place um, scope of the risk as you see in here scope of the risk uh, threat assessment is the same as the process flow diagram uh, in clause 2.5 in Hassan. Uh, all stages when product is under the management uh, control of the site. Uh, essentially, we need to follow that as a scope, the flow diagram, that's our scope for the threat assessment, risk assessment. Some further changes here on food defense. Uh, 421 is uh, significantly enhanced. As you see, the uh, output of the risk assessment shall be documented threat assessment plan. And on the review, it has to be reviewed at least once a year or a new risk emerges, a new threat is publicized or identified. Uh, an incident occurs where product security or food defense is implicated. 422 is completely um, uh, reshuffled, of course, new. Uh, raw materials and products are identified as being risk. A threat assessment plan shall include controls to mitigate those risks. If there are any risks, then uh, much like with the HACCP and food safety plan, uh, where prevention is not sufficient or possible, systems shall be in place to identify any tampering. And of course, the controls have to be monitored on an ongoing basis, uh, results to be documented, and subject to review at least annually. Areas uh, where significant risk is identified shall be defined, monitored, and controlled. These shall include external storage and intake points for products and raw materials, including packaging. And uh, 
Of course, uh, all the personnel have to be trained in site security and other procedures uh, and food defense. And the uh, site shall maintain appropriate registration with the relevant authorities. Uh, this could be uh, in Canada, CFIA, it could be uh, FTA or USDA in, in the US side. Well, this is uh, another uh, new, new uh, section, uh, environmental monitoring. Uh, measures, environmental monitoring, what it does is really, it measures the overall effectiveness of our uh, plant, whether the equipment are hygienically designed, uh, personal practices are, are, are uh, uh, hygienic, uh, and operational methods are, are matching to all this so that we can produce, uh, produce safe products. Environmental uh, monitoring obviously provides information about indicator organisms uh, if we have in our plants. These could be uh, spoilage organisms, as, as benign as spoilage organisms, or as nasty as the pathogens of concern in a timely manner, so that the appropriate corrective actions can be initiated to prevent potential microbial outbreaks. It acts as an early warning system for microbiological hazards, uh, depending on the risk that our products are exposed to, and it helps detect hot spots in a plant that may act as a source of contamination. Uh, overall, it validates basically the hygiene program for the entire plant. Uh, this particular clause has been added, of course, in environmental monitoring uh, for 11.8.1. Um, design of the environmental monitoring program shall be based on risk and at a minimum include sampling protocol, identification of sample locations, frequency of, of tests and target organisms, and, uh, uh, test methods, recording and evaluation of uh, results. Program and its associated procedure shall be documented. Uh, here, what one needs to point out is that the based on risk doesn't mean that we can get out of this program implementation by stating we have no risk because this is uh, at a minimum <clears throat> uh, one of those bar shell closes um, therefore the risk assessment is not going to uh, free us of the environmental monitoring uh, program As I was saying in the beginning, that issue eight uh, uh, has been streamlined very effectively now. Uh, rather than sprinkling this high risk, high care uh, areas throughout the, uh, the standard, now they have been all sort of combined. Because there, uh, there, there are some sites that there is no high risk or high care, uh, so that uh, rather than trying to see the, their, their effect and function in different clauses, they're all put together now. So they could be uh, audited separately and they could be, of course, geared towards uh, separately. And uh, uh, of course, the high risk and high care <clears throat> zones and products are better uh, explained since the uh, uh, arrival of issue seven with that uh, <clears throat> particular decision tree that we have in the, in the, I think, annex two of the issue seven. Uh, which is very useful. Um, that will give us a good uh, idea about where the uh, high, these zones are, whether we are high risk or high care, and etc. Well, pet food is uh, the 5.8 is dedicated to pet food. Uh, uh, this is. Um, I wanted to clarify that pet food is not animal feed. Pet food is also not the uh, byproduct that we might be keeping in our plant uh, to be taken by a, a farmer to feed their animals. That, there is a different clause for that. Pet food is simply the uh, the, the cat food or, or the dog food or the dog treat or the uh, other treats for the pets. 
it could be the fish uh, 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 food and etc. Um, this is this is also in order to be able to benchmark uh, with the GFSIs. Uh, they introduced three new requirements, and here they are. Um, the pet food must be formulated for intended use, whether it's complete diet or complementary for. Uh, uh, growth of uh, a kitten or, or just for general cat food. Uh, management of the ingredients harmful to unintended recipients, which means uh, basically we use certain ingredients for cat food and certain other ingredients for, for dog food and uh, some ingredients may not be um, good for dogs but good for cats or the vice versa, and there are other other examples in other pets, of course. Uh, one has to make sure that the, these ingredients are managed, and of course the label, etc., whatever is, is happening in the process, has to be uh, following this, this requirement. Uh, clause 583, manage, management of medicinal products. Uh, of course, we know that the, some pet food uh, might include certain ingredients, active ingredients actually. There could be uh, even drugs uh, or, or helping or vitamins, whatever they are, uh, might be useful uh, for because these are medicinal products. Uh, excess of their use might cause problems or their contamination into some other food that is not intended for, for that particular uh, group of pets. Uh, might cause problem for for those, so there will be some strict traceability, of course. And then, for instance, uh, we talk about the mass balance. These ingredients are very good examples for uh, mass balance. Of course, uh, one has to review the effectiveness of all these completed activities under this clause. Changes to the audit protocol. So far, we went through the. Uh, the audit requirements. Those are basically clauses from one through eight. And there is a nine as well, which will come through. Um, now, there is also the, the part that most of us are probably not very familiar with the audit protocol. This is in the standard. After the requirements finished, uh, you have an audit protocol section. This is where all the other uh, the important issues are are basically stated. Um, one of the most important uh, changes, of course, is that the issue eight provides sites with two audit options, announced audit, unannounced audit. We used to have unannounced audit was split into two. We had the option one and option two, uh, which would be two different audits. Uh, one would be unannounced, the other. One. So that caused a lot of confusion and Therefore, BRC just let go the option two, and we have announced audits, unannounced audits, and uh, having said that, these are still uh, voluntary. Um, again, BRC has listened to uh, clients and the sites and the uh, large companies and small companies, and then. Uh, a consistent concern raised by key st stakeholders, these, these are the stakeholders I listed, um, th there's a time gap between the audit and the confirmation of certification. As you know, that the audit is in day one and a certificate is issued in day 42. That's, that's, the, that's the limit. But of course, in between, uh, those involved or those are related to this audit outcome uh, are kept in dark because they don't know whether they will receive a certificate. They don't know if everything is okay. Um, therefore, that uh, BRC with the issue 8 is introducing this uh, uh, an interim report. Following each audit, an interim report shall be available on the BRC directory within 10 calendar days. Content strictly limited to the date of the audit details of the audit scope and the non-conformity is found. So there's not going to be a full report there. There will be only, this was the date, this is the scope, and these are the non-conformity uh, found. 
final law which reports should still be available after 42 days. Um, this is one of the new things. Well, the traded goods. <clears throat> issue seven was actually designed uh, the traded goods being part of it. It was part of the accreditation, part of everything. But very few of us knew, knew that. And it was a, a voluntary module, module, voluntary module eight. Uh, now, issue, in issue eight, this was uh, merged into the requirements. Section nine was added, and it's now called traded goods. Uh, if you were familiar with the traded goods voluntary model, the contents are pretty much the same, almost exactly the same. This is an option. This usually relates to those uh, companies, in addition to their own manufacturing facilities, products, they may be purchasing, for instance, getting canned uh, uh, olives from some other country and then selling on their own, their own names or selling to some of the clients. These are strictly traded goods. They bring it, prepacked, store it, and then sell it. So these products, if any sites have it, they could actually, this clause would impl, uh, uh, apply in that case, and then the sites can have those products also under the, uh, under the same certificate. Uh, basically, uh, it's just an additional service if you, if, you, if, you, if you think of that way. Well, here's a summary. Um, standard focus in part on areas or, or perceived weaknesses in issue seven. Uh, the GFSI benchmarking process was, of course, one of the um, parts of it that uh, additional requirements were, were put in place. And uh, uh, there's a lot of guidance, as we said that in the beginning, uh, the issue eight standard was published, as you know, in August uh, 1st. Actually, it was August 1st. It was just ready on. Um, uh, BRC participate and it's free. Uh, on top of, of course, the <clears throat> other uh, interpretation guidance and as well as the uh, the key changes documents. So all three of of them are available and free on BRC participate. And um, question and answer document uh, FAQ is being sort of prepared still. Uh, I, I believe it's going to be published in October. Uh, or through through December because it's going to be added added more and more. Uh, it will be a live document until until December until the audit sort of rolls out. Alongside a gap audit uh, checklist and you know uh, between these two, uh, whatever you, your site has and uh, what you have and what what this standard is. A new guidelines to provide clarification on some of the new areas such as the food safety culture. Training against issue eight will commence in October. Um, great. Thank you, Excel. We've actually, um, I'm gonna click over a screen here. This is our, this is our final um, slide here. If you, I think you reviewed all these points, but feel free to do, to do jump in if you want to clarify anything. There were quite a few folks that asked about how to acquire the standard, so thanks for heading that off and, and just confirming that it is free to download, and that's, of course, where folks would find it as well. So yes, this is um, actually BRC participates much easier than BRC uh, bookstore that I found, and I, I was able to download everything within within ten minutes. That's great. Great. We've actually received quite a few questions, so let me click forward here, and I'll speak to as many as we have time to um, here. Okay. Um, with internal audit requirements, how will this apply for a seasonal operation? For example, when they only operate two to three months in a year. Right, that's always a challenge, uh, even the best times, of course. Uh, but of course, that depending on the, the duration, uh, some seasonal operations I know uh, for, uh, especially in seafood or even uh, produce uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, 
might be just six weeks or four weeks. Uh, uh, therefore, one has to uh, take that into consideration and do it in the beginning and in the end, uh, perhaps. Um, that will that will be helpful. And in between, perhaps, uh, as the programs uh, are implemented and put in place, they could take place even out of season uh, because this, this is basically a writing. And so that when the next audit comes, issue eight, the site will be ready for uh, for all those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Actually, quite a few questions that are similar to that one. So I'll skip through here. Um, who will send the preliminary report ten days after the audit? Is it the auditor, the CB, or do we have to go directly to the BRC directory? Um, Right now, uh, the uh, communication is that it will be, as I mentioned in the presentation, it will be uploaded to the BRC directory. Um, and of course, whenever we upload anything in the BRC directory, a copy always goes to, like the final audit report and certificate, I imagine that we will be sending the certification body will be sending uh, to the site um, the, the interim report. In, interim report, by the way, uh, after every audit, uh, the last day of the audit, normally we give, this is our practice anyway, uh, we give the, the NCR, which contains the scope, date of the audit, and the non-conformances. So I imagine it will be, nothing really will change from that perspective, uh, except that we are going to be uploading that in 10 days, uh, or within 10 days to the BRC director. Okay, very good, thank you. Is the forthcoming training that will be available in, Ontario, in October, is it mandatory? Not at all. I, I mean, trainings are not m mandatory at all. It's a uh, it's useful tool for for uh, being familiarized with, with the jargon itself, with its standard, the new issue. Uh, uh, other than those, uh, well, it might help implement stuff, but uh, by no means it's mandatory. Okay. Is a suggestion box sufficient to cover off clause 1.1.6? Um, I thought about that, and maybe. It's just uh, uh, depending on the, the well, the, uh, the, the reception of the culture of the, of the plant, right? Uh, as long as it produces the following results that the standard uh, is asking, then okay. Uh, everything has to be linked rather than doing things individually separately. If the, if the suggestion box is going to meet all the other requirements down, down below uh, and other parts in, in the standard, then by all means, yeah, that's, that's, that's the site solution. So, but it has to be not done just to, okay, we put a box there and I got it out of the way. It has to be done in uh, cooperation with the other subsequent requirements. Okay, very good. Um, can you just clarify, Excel, the interpretation has not been issued yet. When um, will it be issued? Did you have a date? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Actually, it's there. It's there. Oh, yeah. it is there now. Uh, I beg your pardon. August 1st. Yeah, August 1st. All three documents were there and I downloaded them. On. I beg your pardon. Okay. Uh, all three. Okay. Um, okay. So this is specific to SAA Global as a CB, but perhaps we could just sort of um, broadly answer it on behalf of this inquiry. Um, will we align the CAR, the evidences and root cause requirements for both BRC and customer addendums? So I guess first party audit requirements. And you still feel free, if you're not able to hmm. comment on that, we can certainly take that offline with this individual. Um, it's an interesting sure, uh, we, we don't we don't combine things uh, currently because you know the the GFSI audits have their own sort of uh, life, so to speak, or a cycle. Uh, whereas addendums uh, from the first parties are, uh, even though they are linked. Okay, sort of. An okay. We, we we handle them ourselves basically. We handle them ourselves right now. It's an additional task for us. Sure, sure. And we're happy to follow up with this um, client separately, so okay. that's, that's great. Thank you, Andrea, for your question. Um, for suppliers who do not fit under a GFSI category, 
How are these viewed during an audit as it pertains to supplier approval and GFSI benchmarking? Yeah, on that uh, uh, second slide, uh, uh, there was a second part, you know, either GFSI or or a, a third party audit or uh, where we will see the evidence of one. Uh, the auditor uh, was qualified for this demonstrably. Demonstrably means that auditor is really an auditor uh, to the, the contents of the, of the report provided. Uh, have to contain all those requirements, anything from HACCP to, to traceability. It has to be convincing, in other words. Uh, there shouldn't be any any sort of... Uh, there's also the questionnaire uh, alternative. Uh, I think it's in the, in the standard. I didn't put all the slides in there, um, but it also ha it comes with other... Uh, additional requirements because the GFSI we know what we're going to get we, we know that the site will have HACCP we know the uh, so the if there is a third party audit they have to basically match somehow because we don't know in GFSI we know the auditor was qualified qualified for that category and then this is the standard you can go and read it so we need to know uh, what the other audit third party audit contains and whether those contents are a match to what we are looking for. Okay. And I think the last question for today, I've been able to answer most of them as we go here. So can you just reconfirm, when is the standard fully in compliant for the industry? Is there a time frame? So you indicated that audits commence February of 2019 and when um, must be, they must be fully compliant by? On February 1st, 2019. Yeah, so the, so the question, there's a few folks that have framed it, the question this way. So past February 1st, um, you're required to be f fully compliant. So it's about six months, I guess, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, from today, yes. Because uh, uh, you see, when implementing a new program or, or new procedures and plans, uh, we, we put it in place, implement it, and immediately do an audit, see if it's working. Uh, then and we are ready for the February 1st. February 1st, when the auditor uh, audits against the issue eight, uh, uh, everything has to have been implemented. Yeah, okay, great. That's great, that's all the questions we have for today. Yuxel, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very informative. Thanks to everyone for attending. We'll send a link to the recording along with the slide deck within two business days and a listing of our training courses in case folks are interested in learning about that. And I thank you very much for your attendance. Have a wonderful day.